one more announcement. Kids ministry is going on tonight. So if you can bring back your kids <laughs> to the kids church, uh, Jen and JLo will be teaching tonight. And don't worry, parents, I'm going to be doing the beginning, just review, but I'm going to also start in prayer. Um, yeah, let's just take a moment. I just feel like sometimes when you're about to speak and you just feel like the words that you have are very, very weak, and we just need the Lord to break in in our meeting. Um, so, Lord, we just thank you. We lift you up. And Lord, we just declare that you're the chief shepherd and that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And we ask you to break in in our meeting tonight, Lord. We ask you to release a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Lord, I just say, help, help me, help me to articulate what's on your heart. Just surrender ourselves to you. God, we w we're here because we want to encounter you. We don't want to go through the motions. We don't want just another service, Lord, that we have the privilege of coming before the living God through your torn flesh, through your blood. And I just thank you for awe and wonder filling our hearts. Lord, I ask that you would draw us near to you by your spirit tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, I wasn't planning on teaching tonight, I'm filling in, and I uh, actually just came back from a trip up to Massachusetts to see my grandparents, and I uh, came back, and I had taught the week prior, so this is two weeks ago, and I was intending to share a message that night, about two weeks ago, and the Lord kind of pulled a quick one on me, and uh, my whole message got scrambled, ended up sharing something that was slightly different. I had uh, had some parts of my original message um, that I shared, but I'm just going to do a quick review because the message tonight is going to build upon my last message. Also, um, I've been involved in a uh, series uh, called Becoming Sons of the Eternal Priesthood, which uh, stemmed from the beginning of this year. Coming into the beginning of this year, the Lord gave me a word that 2021 was going to be the year of the priesthood, um, the year of the book of Hebrews, actually, uh, which I came to understand as the year of the priesthood. And he then continued to give me a word th that this year was a bar mitzvah year, just kind of a strange, you know, okay, Lord, what does that mean? And um, I've come to understand as I've been doing this series that he is desiring to mature his people into our eternal calling as priests. Uh, for the most part, the understanding of the priesthood of Melchizedek has been pretty weak across the body of Christ. And it's actually, the Lord has kind of lit my heart on this subject, and it's, uh, it's what I've been going after recently. But I believe in specifically for his church in this hour, for us, that he wants us to go from eating milk, per se, to eating strong meat. And to have our senses sharpened, um, it's actually kind of quite alarming. If you've read the book of Hebrews, you know it's pretty deep. There's a lot there. But the writer, the author of the book of Hebrews actually says to the Hebrews that he has much more to say, but that he can't say it because they become dull of hearing. <laughs> so the book of Hebrews is actually written to a people who are, quote unquote, dull of hearing. Um, which shows that there's so much more to grasp, not only from this book, but as we seek the Lord, he has uh, much more revelation on the priest of Melchizedek to share with us. Um, as a review, I, I've, ha I've done two, uh, before the message I gave two weeks ago, I've done two uh, messages on uh, becoming sons of the eternal priesthood. And the first one was called uh, Becoming the Sacrifice, or Be the Sacrifice. And we discussed what it means to be a son priest, who gives himself to God as a living sacrifice so God can give him to his brethren. And then in the second message I presented, uh, it was on the importance of keeping Sabbath and how Sabbath is not just a weekly ordinance where, you know, uh, one day a week, but that it is a moment-by-moment uh, -moment heart posture of trust where our hearts are yoked to Christ so that our ability, 
or to actually respond to the Lord in worship is preserved. If we don't keep Sabbath, we are unable to actually respond to the Lord. The very word, you might hear it said in different circles, like, you know, this tension between, oh, what is God's role as sovereign and our responsibility? Well, it's interesting because the very word responsibility is the ability to respond. And so it is our role to preserve our ability to respond by keeping Sabbath rest. And so that was my second message. And you can, if you need help going back and finding that message and listening to the details, I can, uh, I have them stored on, on YouTube. And so I can share that with you. But the message tonight I have titled as Approving the Excellent to be Volunteers in the Day of His Power. Um, and this message is going to run pretty parallel to the, just kind of the treasure the Lord has deposited in me over the last few months. And I kind of gave a sneak peek into this on my last message two weeks ago. And so I kind of want to do a quick review of that last message. But you know, one of the questions you might ask is, well, why this message now? So over the last uh, several months, the Lord very clearly and, and, uh, and in a way that I can't like manipulate has, ve- has made the message clear that his coming is soon. And to the capacity of what that means, I'm going to leave that up to you, but that he's made it very clear. Judgment is coming. I'm standing at the door. I am near. And so he's given me a sense of urgency for our house to prepare our hearts in the delay. And uh, last, uh, two weeks ago, we learned, uh, we talked about resisting cold love. We, ex- we talked about the message from uh, where Jesus talks about in Luke 12, about the unfaithful servant who beats his fellow servants when the master doesn't come during the first watch. He comes, you know, maybe the third watch. And so it's really important to fight for love in the delay because in the lord's it's just one of the you can find it in the bible you can find in the scriptures there's this pattern that the lord has that he gives a word and he says i'm coming and you're like yeah okay and we're praying we're ramped up and then as it gets closer and closer to his coming that darkness seems to increase and it gets darker and it actually seems like god has almost like abandoned us completely and the heart begins to grow discouraged, and it's like, where are you, God? What are you doing? And it's in that season that he gives a lot, he gives a lot of instruction of how we are to steward our hearts, right? And so Jesus even said, he, in the end times, he said, he who possesses his soul to the end shall be saved. So we have a responsibility to possess our soul by the Spirit, by the grace of the Lord. And it's important, and one of the things, what we talked about two weeks ago is that we have to fight for each other's value. We, we, I explained two ways of that looks like. One, not complaining against our brethren. Complaining is not good before the Lord comes. We learned that from the Old Testament as well. But the second one was uh, not or seizing to fight for our brother's value through not rebuking them when they fall into error. Not reaching out and pulling them out, but just saying, you know what, who cares? And at, in a season where lawlessness begins to abound, where darkness seems to increase... It's extremely important that we actively resist cold love through staying in the word, through staying connected to Jesus, his heart. And um, I also discussed two weeks ago about the Isaiah 6, how we need to be a people sent from heaven. We need to be connected to the one who's like Jasper and Sardius stone, who's, whose heart is on fire and he is zealous for his bride and he is jealous and he is... Uh, pure in his motives. He's light, and there is no darkness in him at all. And we have to, we have to be connected to, to that reality in a uh, culture that is becoming colder and colder and colder and desensitized to, each, to the value of humanity. And then uh, one of the things that stirred me, I've asked the Lord even about the issue of mass. You know, it's like, okay, God, what, what's the big push for mass other than a control push? And he, uh, what came to my heart was just desensitizing, is that when you get, when you grow up children in a culture that, and you hide their face, there's a reason why David said, Lord, do not hide your face from me, right? And so we are, the, we, we portray the image and the glory of God, and when you hide that expression, you begin to create children who desensitize to the humanity, to the soul inside of people. And then it's easy, like we've seen in uh, in the history of Nazi Germany, it's easy then to get people to do what you want them to do, 
to, to kill and murder people because it, it seems like they're not really people. And so we have a culture where this is increasing, and it's the, why it's so important as the people of God that we are connected to the heart of God, who has never stopped, who even when the world has grown cold, his heart is still on fire. And so we have to be a people who's connected to that in the place of prayer. And so I build upon that uh, review as we go into our message tonight on approving the excellent to be volunteers in the day of his power. Uh, I want to clarify what does it mean to be volunteers in the day of his power, which I totally forgot to give the reading of the word. I want to do that. So we have two scriptures we're going to open tonight with. And uh, the first one is going to be Philippians 1, 9 through 11. So if you can flip with me, and I'm going to actually have you stand. Sorry, a little unconventional, out of order here. But if you can stand with me, and we're going to read, we're going to read this scripture, and then we're also going to turn to Psalm 110.3. And these are the two banner uh, scriptures over uh, the message tonight. And so this is Paul's prayer for the Philippians. He says in verse 9, chapter 1, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more, in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And we say thanks be to God. And then uh, Psalm, I'm going to actually read from verse 1 through verse uh, 4. Psalm 110, verse 1 through verse 4. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. In holy array from the womb of the dawn, your youth are to you as the dew. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Praise be to God. Oh, y'all can sit down. <laughs> Thank you. So, we have this expression, the day of his power. I'll be honest, when I uh, used to read this, I uh, always thought of a temporary season or time, the Lord's second coming, where he takes care of justice and he does things and reinstates his kingdom, and that is true. That is the day of his power. Um, which is why when I was preparing this message, I really struggled to include it in the series on, on that has to do with the priesthood of Melchizedek. Because you're like, you think priesthood of Melchizedek and you think of this unchanging, eternal, forever priesthood. And then you think of the day of his power and you think of something that's very specific and temporary and almost momentary, right? But then the Holy Spirit corrected me. And uh, first of all, by just looking at Psalm 110, and we see that this commission from the Lord to the Lord, is that about you, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, also includes that your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power. And God, just by the Spirit, reminded me that heaven is the day of his power, it is the day that never ends. <laughs> and so whenever Jesus, uh, in whatever, wherever the, his reign is, wherever his perfect rule is, is where his kingdom is. And is where heaven's at. And so as his people, we are bringing heaven to earth through our prayers. And he eventually will come in his physical embodiment. That Jesus will come and he will uh, rule the nations and, and bring the kingdom. But uh, I believe that the kingdom is also now in a continuum with the Lord and through forever. And so this message of, okay, maturing as sons of the priesthood. Um, for the day of his power is not like a temporary thing. We're just preparing for this one momentary piece of time, and then we go into heaven and everything gets jolly. No, what I'm teaching you tonight is how to prepare our hearts for your eternal assignment as a priest. Because the day of his power, heaven is the day of his power. It's the day that never ends. And so I just, I really want to draw attention to that uh, so that we don't see this as just a, oh, this is just a temporary or momentary um, assignment or uh, message. This is a message that applies to our eternal calling. Um, I gave the review on resisting co-love, and so we pick up um, 
at the end of what I taught two weeks ago, I encourage you to go and review it for those who haven't heard. Um, but the first part of it, which ended up being the whole message, was resisting co-love, being connected to the fire of God's heart. And I'm going to repeat a point I made because it's important as a building block in this message. But if you remember 1 Peter 4, and I mentioned this verse two weeks ago, it says that in the end, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. And so we have to set our hearts to be fervent and to abound in love. And we have, one might ask themselves, okay, but how do we do that? And what I'm going to repeat is that one of the ways that we do that is we have to be connected to God's heart, how personal Jesus is, how personally moved he is when we minister to our brethren. And this is such an encouraging word. I think it's worth repeating and saying again. And so I'm going to have you turn to Philippians for me. And we're going to start in verse, uh, let's see here. I'm going to start reading verse 3 of chapter 1 of Philippians. It says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the very first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And I'm going to stop there for a second. This is an amazing promise. Right, we love this. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. But then we ask the question, Paul, how can you say such a thing with that confidence? And he answers us in verse 7, for it is only right for me to feel this way. Why? Because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. So let's put this in perspective. Paul is imprisoned. He's beaten. I mean, you go to Corinthians, and there's a list of sufferings that Paul's endured. And yet, you, despite what Paul's experienced, you look at the Philippians' participation, and it's through financial contribution, and it's through encouragement in a season where even Paul says, I have no one of a kindred spirit, for all seek their own interests, not the interests of Christ. But you look at what the Philippians did, and it looks so weak compared to Paul. Right? It doesn't seem very impressive to what Paul's endured, and yet Paul says, I have you in my heart. I have you in my heart, and I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. This phrase, I have you in my heart, it's not a cheap phrase. It's not an empty expression. Paul was actually identifying with the emotions of Jesus himself. When Paul says, I have you in my heart, how much more does Christ say, I have you in my heart? when we love his people in his name. We underestimate how moved Jesus is when we participate in his ministry, how loyal and gracious he is, and how faithful he is if we don't quit. This is encouraging, and we need to tap into this reality. It's the only way. If we do not tap into this reality, it, we will not be able to press through the times ahead. So it's very important. Let's look at some other scriptures on this. Uh, Matthew ten forty two. Jesus says, whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Hebrews 6.10, for God is not unjust to forget your work and the love which you have shown towards his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. This is important. <laughs> we don't lean upon our past works of righteousness. It's, it's, it's a perpetual loving and still ministering to the saints. So yes, Jesus is personally moved by what you did 10 years ago for him in love. But if you're leaning on that as your righteousness now, right, that's a problem. So Paul emphasizes it's in having ministered and it's in still ministering to the saints. So this goes back to our, my last message where we have to be continually active and engaging uh, against, warring against cool love and fighting to be fervent in love and actively loving our brother. And then lastly, Matthew 25, 40, where Jesus says, The king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one, to the, to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them you did them to me. So let's continue to verse 8. It says, For God is my witness, how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. The, the uh, Greek word, I'm going to actually expound on a lot of the Greek words tonight, but I want to preface it with this. None of it is to replace the meaning. I 
I'm just going deeper. There's a lot more uh, substance when you, when you look at um, all the meanings. And so there will be a lot of like, hey, let's look at this Greek word. I encourage you to go back and look at yourself. Um, but you'll see they don't alter the meaning. They just really kind of give it more meat. So this, uh, the Greek word for long for is epitheo. And it means to intensely crave, greatly desire. Even Strong's Concordance uses the word lust. It's an intense desire. And the Greek word for uh, affection is, uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, it's black nun. <laughs> sounds German. But it sounds, uh, it means bowels or intestines or inward parts. It literally means your intestines. So what Paul is essentially saying is he's saying, I intensely crave you. I intensely desire you with the very inward longings of Jesus. That's like, whoa. That's intense. Like, what? <laughs> when I was actually reading this, the Lord, and I encourage you to go and read this, these first eight verses and just ask the Lord to encounter your heart because when I was reading it, you know, I've always read it as Paul's words to the Philippians, but the Holy Spirit, when I was reading it, just encountered me, and he turned Paul's words as if Jesus was speaking to myself, and instead of the Philippians, he turned it directly toward me. And so I, I ask you to insert your name. I'm going to paraphrase what he said. You know, it, it came as a spiritual impression, but uh, I encourage you to insert your name in this. But he said, Charles, in view of your participation in the gospel, from the first day until now, I have you in my heart. Oh, how I intensely desire you with my innermost being. Every time you stand for me, every time you give to me, pray for your enemy, share an encouraging word. Every time you honor me, my word, and my people, oh, how it makes me want you all the more. The Lord is speaking that to us. And when we connect to that reality, there's nothing that can stop us. How can we fail if the king of the universe, the judge of heaven and earth, is moved with intense desire because of our faithfulness towards him through participating in his ministry? Let's be reminded, it's his ministry. When you love your brother, he sees that as personally loving him. We get it confused in the church. We, many times we start with something the Lord gives. We possess it. We make it our own. And then we come to God as if he is not connected with what we're doing. And we ask him to bless what we're doing. But it's the other way around. The fellowship of love always was between the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And he, out of the overflow of his heart, created us to bring us into his fellowship and his ministry. And so it's important that we stay connected to that. That's where we see the power. That's where we see the Spirit move is when our hearts are oriented that it starts with him and it's his ministry. So I say all that to say that this prayer that we read in the beginning, verses 9 through 11, is in light of Paul experiencing this intense craving of Christ towards the Philippians. And so I'm going to read it again. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want to zero in on the phrase, things that are excellent. It's a very unique phrase. Things that are excellent. What in the world can that mean? Well, we're going to study that tonight. It's in the title of our message. So, um, so like I always do, I always go to the Greek words when I, I need deeper meaning, and I, I, I review it. I look at other ways the words are translated throughout the New Testament to compare them and get a fuller picture. And so we're going to do that. We're going to do a little study. Uh, the Greek word is the word diaphero. And the word means to bear, like bear like a burden. It means to carry, which kind of is the same thing as bear. It means to differ in value or glory. And it's one word. That expression, things that are excellent, are, is the one Greek word. And so let's look how it's translated in some other verses. Matthew 10, 31, and Matthew 12, 12, where Jesus says, You are more valuable than many sparrows. That word, more valuable, it's the word diaphero. He also says, How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? Like, once again, more valuable. Same thing, Greek word diaphero. In Mark eleven sixteen, 16, where Jesus tells uh, the people in the temple that he cannot permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple, that word carry is diaphero. 
It's also in Acts 27, 27, where Paul says, oh, the waves drove us up and down, that we're driven or carried, depending on the translation, it's the word diaphero. And then once again, in Romans uh, 2.18, where uh, Paul's talking about, he says, uh, the Jews that know God's will, they distinguish between the things which differ being instructed out of the law. That expression, things which differ, Greek word, diaphero. And before you're exhausted with my study, we'll do one more. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 15.41 reads, There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. The word differs. Guess what? It's the word diaphero. So we ask ourselves, how do these two meanings, how, how does the word carry and bear, as we see in some of the translations, and then differing in value and glory, and then in, in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, things that are excellent, how do all these come together? They seem completely distinct. Well, let's just think about it. Let's suppose that your house is on fire. And I'm not, that's not a curse. That's just, we're just thinking hypothetically, so let's not freak out. Uh, but let's just say your house is on fire, and you have 30 seconds to go into your house and to pick one thing that you can grab with your hands. Sums up my whole word right here. Might as well close it down. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yes, you got 30 seconds to go in and pick up something. Let's say your wife is out. Everyone's out. Is, you, you go in and get one object. What do you choose? You've got lots of things that are good. You have obviously have them in your house. You wouldn't have them in your house for no reason, hopefully. <laughs> um, but you have to pick one. How much does it tell you about your heart when you choose that one thing? So what do you do when you pick up? When you have to choose one thing, you have to pick it up. You have to carry it, right? So we don't have, back then, back in ancient times and when Paul's writing this, they had horses, they had donkeys, they didn't have cars, they didn't have trailers. You couldn't, like, load up a bunch of stuff and go from point A to point B like we do, hauling a bunch of things around, right? They had to be very selective about what they chose, about what they carried, they had to make choices constantly what is actually most valuable, and it was directly connected to what they physically carried. If you remember uh, from the message, if you were here when I taught on keeping Sabbath, um, I mentioned that every choice that we make comes back down to the garden between the, the tree of knowledge and good and evil and the tree of life. It's always a choice. One is trusting God that leads to life. The other is trusting in yourself or something else that leads to death. And when we can discern that and we choose life, we'll always stay in Sabbath rest. I also said that choosing, keeping Sabbath rest is discerning what is him and what is simply not him. Whatever is him leads to rest. Whatever is not him re results in burden or bondage. And then lastly, I use the stories of Nehemiah where Nehemiah instructed the people on the Sabbath to not carry burdens. There's our word carry again. Carry burdens on the Sabbath. They were allowed to carry burdens the other days of the week, but not on that day because it was holy. And when someone did carry a burden on the day that they were not supposed to work, it indicated something about their heart. It, and the Bible uses this phrase, unjust gain. It's greed. Work is good, but you can work from the motivation of greed. So, we come back to the phrase, the things that are excellent. We see that in the Greek, based on how it's translated throughout the New Testament, it means to know what is worthy to be carried, what is most valuable. You, you have to know what to choose. Therefore, Paul's prayer, if I could paraphrase is that he says, I pray that you would be overflowing in love to a greater degree and a greater degree because you are learning through, uh, when it says real knowledge and discernment, this is a real life application. You're learning day to day through experience. You're approving. You're approving. That word approving means testing, examining. You can't test and examine something if you never move forward, if you never actually make mistakes. Like, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to sometimes make the wrong choices. That's where the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. But you got to move forward and you got to get active in loving each other and choosing and learning what is most excellent, what is worthy. 
But he says, I pray that through growing in the knowledge of God and practical life application, that you will learn to say yes to what burdens are worthy to be carried and what burdens are not worthy to be carried. In other words, okay, should I pick this one up or should I leave it down? Should I, am I carrying something that I need to let go? Because if we're carrying something that we're not supposed to carry, it directly quenches love. And so that you see that our capacity to love is connected to our ability to discern what is excellent. So question, why, and I kind of answered some of it, but why is it important to know and discern what motives and burdens to say yes to? Paul answers us in verse 10. So that we may be sincere and blameless till the day of Christ. This Greek word for sincere is elokrinis, and it literally means to be tested or judged by sunlight. It's very interesting. Sunlight is a full exposure. So you can, you know, have some things that are, you look under this lighting and they look clean, but if you bring it into the complete noonday sun, you'll see every single spot and stain will be exposed. The day of Christ is a day of full exposure. The day of his power is a day of judgment and it's a day of revival. But it's the day not just when our works are judged, but it's the day when our motives are judged as well. This is important. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 5, do not, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. Right, we see Jesus teach in the Sermon on the Mount. Do these things in secret because your Father sees and he will reward you publicly. Part of that public reward is now. We see that. We get blessed. A lot of that public reward is going to be on the day of his power. And this is the burden of my heart. As a people, I, I don't, really, if I could sum up this entire message tonight before we go any further. It's about preparing our hearts and stewarding our souls so that when his outpouring comes, whether it be his actual second coming or if it's an outpouring of his spirit, that we have no regret, that we can step right into his ministry as volunteers instead of having to be the ones receiving ministry. What does Jesus say about the pure in heart? He says, they shall see God. So we see that learning to say yes to what is excellent day to day, learning to make, th these are not big choices. This is not like, oh, should I buy the, you know, $60,000 truck or not buy the $60,000 truck? You know, this is day to day small choices. I can give you an example for me personally. You know, one day, um, I'm, I like a clean house. I like to order. I'm a little OCD. I admit that, okay? Um, I, part of it was not my upbringing. I was, became an engineer, and it kind of got trained into me. But I like things orderly in the right places, and I like things clean. And that's great when you're a single person. I had a you know, spotless house, and then you get married, and you got some children. And now it's like if I could freeze time, and I could clean the office, and then unfreeze time, and go and be with my wife and child— Fantastic, but I can't do that, right? So I'm put into a position where I actually have to choose what is excellent. And so one day I'm cleaning the office and I'm like organizing and I'm filing things. And it's been something that's been on my list to do for a while. And I hear my, ba you know, James or maybe you know, eight-month-year-old crying in the other room. And I know Jayla's busy. I know he needs a diaper changed. And I'm like, ah, he'll be okay. I just need to get this done. You know, he'll be okay. And then the Lord, he always does this with me in these situations. He'll let me go, you know, and I'm wrestling. Is it right? Is it wrong? I'm, you know, justifying it. And all of a sudden, he just breaks in, and he suddenly doesn't make it about a choice of what is right or wrong. Because, see, it's real easy to get analytical and think in our minds and weigh things. Oh, is it right or wrong? Should we do this or not do this? And justify it ourselves. But when Jesus judges us on judgment day, it ain't going to be about right or wrong. It's going to be, did you love me or did you not love me? Did you say yes to me or did you say no to me? It's an acceptance and a rejection in every little choice that we make. And so he confronts me in this, in this choice and he says, Charles, do you want me or do you want your office to be ordered and cleaned? Can it be both, Lord? Like, you know, but no. Like, in that moment, I had to choose. 
I had to let my office be messy to go be with my son because that's where Jesus was. It wasn't really just about going taking care of James' diaper. It was about being with Jesus because that's where he was ministering. We also see examples in the Bible of this. I'm going to give some. We, we see uh, in Luke 10, 38 through 42, is the story of Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, right? And we, Martha's busy doing the dishes and, you know, cleaning and cooking, and she gets upset at Mary who's sitting at Jesus' feet and says, you know, Jesus, tell, tell Mary to help, help me here. You know, I'm, I'm a little stressed out. Does she care? You know, and Jesus is like, Martha, Martha, you're too occupied with too many things. Like, Mary has chosen the good part, and it will not be taken from her. And many, you know, I've heard it every time, you know, like you're in the house and, and like you're serving or doing dishes and, or something. And you're like, oh, you're being a Martha. And it's like it has nothing to do with doing dishes or cleaning or being busy. It has nothing to do with that. The issue was not about Martha working because we are to work hard. And Jesus worked really hard. The issue is choosing what's excellent. Jesus, the living word of God, was sitting and was speaking. And Martha was busy washing dishes. Martha, you're dealing with things that are going to perish with their use, but Mary knows what's eternal, and she knows what's lasting. And in that moment, she made the choice. That's what Jesus was highlighting. And that's what we have to be discerning and choose, because without knowing it, in the delay where it seems like God's presence isn't quite there, it just seems like there's a lull, lawlessness is abounding, it's really easy to start getting distracted. We have to set our hearts to continue to fight for what is excellent. We also see Mary... And uh, I believe it's Mary of uh, Bethany who did this, but he broke the alabaster box over Jesus' head and anointed his feet. And who was upset about it, right? Judas Iscariot. And he was upset because he said, well, this, could, this was a waste. This could have been used for the poor. Is taking care of the poor a good thing? Yeah, it is. Jesus even said, whenever you wish, which is really interesting. He said, whenever you wish, you can go take care of the poor. But he said... You have the poor with you always, but you do not have me always with you. In that moment, Mary knew what was worth it, what was most valuable. And if you notice, it always comes down to choosing where he is. What is he? There's lots of good choices, even in Christian ministry. Lots of good choices, but sometimes the excellent thing is not doing any ministry, right? And just sitting at his feet. So, I want to, before we go forward, I want to, before we examine more of what is excellent, because I want to go into more detail of that, um, let's do a quick review of what's not excellent, because it's always uh, healthy to take the reverse logic and say, okay, what is not good? <laughs> so, Psalm 119, verse 36 and 37 reads, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. Some translations say dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your ways. What are the worthless things? I used to read this verse, and the thing that always struck me was like, oh, David's talking about lust and like pornography or something. That's the always what came to my mind. Like, don't look at worthless things. But as I've grown, I've realized that the worthless thing is anything that's not him right then. <coughs> it could be something he did last season. The Lord could have led you to do something last season, but if it's not what he's doing right now, it's worthless. It has no profit. Jesus said, I mean, this is crazy, right? 1 Corinthians 13 says that you can give your, you know, you can give to the poor. You can give your body to be burned. You can know all the mysteries of heaven and knowledge and be super wise, but if you don't have love, you, have, you profit nothing. Love is the excellent thing, as we will explore he is love. Paul laments in his letter to the Philippians that there are those who proclaim Christ out of love and those who proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition and not pure motives. He says this in uh, one, chapter 117 and chapter 2, verses 3. This uh, Greek word for selfish ambition, it means to electioneer or jockey for position. In other words, it's a political maneuvering to get your interest put into place. What is scary about this is that you can be do, you being doing something as 
beautiful and as glorious as preaching Christ and yet not be doing it with a pure motive and it be selfish ambition. And actually, what did it result? What was the fruit of it? It actually brought harm to Paul. It troubled him. Passion and zeal do not equate to purity of heart. This is, this is important. Passion and zeal are extremely important, and there is a holy, righteous passion and zeal, and we need that. Like I said in I, my, when I was talking about Isaiah 6, you know, Isaiah went from woe is me into utter confidence because the coal of the altar touched his lips and took away his sin, and he saw the one who was like Jasper and Sardius stone, the one who was passionate and zealous and pure and light and consuming fire. So we need that. But it's important because we can be very passionate about something, very zealous, and think that our zeal is the approval that it's right. Let's look at James 3. Starting in verse 13. It says, who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, and the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So there's that selfish ambition word again, right? But notice that it's paired with another word. What is that word? Some translations say envy. Mine says jealousy. It's interesting. You know what the Greek word for that uh, jealousy is? It's zealous. It's actually where we derive the word zeal from. But notice how it's contrasted to the wisdom from above. The what it, what's the first thing on the list about the wisdom from above? It's first pure. Yeah, I, I don't know what all the translations say. My New American Standard says pure. It's pure. Everything has to flow from purity. And it's what, another key phrase. It's from above. The indicative of zeal, we, and I said this also two weeks ago, but it's the zeal. We're seeing a lot of zeal stir up. We're seeing a lot of people angry. They're becoming awakened to what's going on in our country. But it's a zeal that's not in righteousness. It's a zeal that's not pure. And so we have the corruption and the oppression and the tyranny on this side, and now there's a rebellion and there's a people coming up that's unrest with an with a unrighteous zeal to counter the rebellion. And this is a thing that's happened throughout the ages. But as peacemakers, right, are sons of God, why? Because they come from above. Because Jesus is sitting right in the middle, and he's a just judge without impartiality. He's not partial. And he has a word that exposes both sides. And he will bring justice. And he hates lawlessness. And he's anointed with the oil of gladness. So we have to be a people who comes from heaven with the seed that's from above. And, and we're going to talk about how do we get that seed. How do we get that seed that comes from above? But if we have a zeal and we have something that's stirred up and it's not from him, it's really scary. The Bible actually says, according to James 3, that it is earthly, natural, and demonic. So how do we guard our hearts from this, though? How do we guard our hearts? And the Lord's faithful, and I say this. He's very merciful. In my experience, I've had unrighteous zeal. <laughs> but he's very quick and swift to discipline me and correct me. But how do we guard our hearts to falling prey? Let's go back to Philippians. I know we're doing a lot of flipping, but Philippians 2, verse 3, starting in verse 3. Paul says, Do nothing from selfish ambition 
or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. I want to focus on this phrase that Paul says, regard one another as more important than yourself. The Greek word for regard, it actually, it, it means to regard, to rule, to lead, to go before, to influence. So it carries this leadership or this influence meaning behind it. And the Greek word for better than or more important, it means specifically a higher ranking official. So like if you're in the military, it's someone of a higher rank than you. So if you piece these things together, you know, amplified version here, it says influence or lead others as though they are the higher ranking official. Kind of gives a new expression to what it means to submit to one another, right? You can lead someone and actually be submitted to them as well. And the Lord actually used this, um, <clears throat> he used, he, the Holy Spirit spoke this to me when I was reading this and it clicked. And he says, Charles, what is it like to lead a king? I want you guys to think about that for a second. How do you lead a king? See, God calls us all kings and priests. But some of us have been given the authority from the king of kings to lead other people, to shepherd them, to steward them. But how would you lead another king? Would you act like a know-it-all, right? Would you be rash? Would you be quick to speak? Or would you lead them very cautiously and very carefully with honor and dignity because you know their value? See, in order to abound in love, we also need to abound in respect as well. We need the spirit of wisdom and revelation, as Paul prays in Ephesians, to open the eyes of our understanding so that we know what's the hope of his calling. And he says this, the riches of his glory the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We have to see the glorious riches in each other. Paul's prayer that love would abound still more and more is not so that we have more emotional experiences or goosebumps. His prayer is that love would abound to the measure that we grow in the understanding of each other's value and respect. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What we value is what we love. Love and respect go together. It is very difficult to love what you don't respect. This is why our capacity to love increases to the degree we, we experientially know and discern what is worthy of respect. So and when Paul's praying, your love would abound more and more in real knowledge and discernment as you prove the things that are excellent, as you begin to approve the things that are excellent, and you begin to see the value of your brother and the value of the Lord, your capacity to love increases as well. You can't increase in the capacity to love the Lord and your brother if you don't grow in the revelation of their worth and value. I'm going to give you an illustration from the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 4. There's a group of people called the Kohathites who are Levites, and they're a, they're a subsection of the Levites, and they're assigned to carry the holy vessels of the temple, the holy objects. And as long as the objects are covered, that's the only condition. Why? Because only Aaron and his sons are allowed to see the holy objects of the temple because they stand in the holy presence of God in the Holy of Holies. So the Kohathites, they can carry the vessels, but the, they have to be covered. What does this mean for us? First, we have to understand why God gives coverings. He doesn't give coverings to reject. The enemy twists and perverts that and wants to make it seem like God's rejecting you. God doesn't give coverings to reject. He gives coverings to protect. See, each one of us are the holy vessels of the temple. We are the temple, and everything in it is the vessels of the temple. And what's sad is we can spend years in ministry, and it's not just ministry. Ministry is what you do in your home. It's what you do with your rela any relationship at work. So don't, like, let's not pigeonhole this to just church. 
you can spend years in ministry carrying each other in prayer and ministering and stewarding people before the Lord and yet have a very little capacity to love them because that covering is still over the holy vessels. You're carrying the vessels, but you can't see their value and worth. Why? Because God has to open the eyes of our heart to see the riches of the glory of his inheritance in one another so that we can love, but we have to have a heart that's set to love them. God has coverings throughout the Bible. Um, the reason why God gives parables, honestly, is because his word is precious. And if he were just to speak his word and we didn't do it and we just, eh, whatever, we would die. Like he, he tre his word is holy, right? The word made flesh is his son. It's the most precious place in his heart. So God gives a parable, a covering, so to actually protect us and what is precious. So that we actually have to search and the one who's hungry to know his heart has to seek it out and then he reveals more and more. And as we will learn when we talk about friendship with Jesus, is that friends obey, have learned to obey God and do whatever he commands. So that's why he talks to them plainly, because they cherish his word. But he won't give a word if we don't have a heart that treasures and value. Just like a, an expensive diamond or anything that's expensive, right? A Ferrari. Like, just think of anything that's really valuable. There are security measures that go around protecting what is valuable. But this is actually what's really amazing about the gospel is that the veil in the temple was there to protect the most holy place. And what is the most holy and precious thing to God? Bless you. What is, the mo what is most treasured in the depths of his heart? Say people? Sons of God? Yeah, no, that's a good answer. It's his, it is his son. It's his son. It's Jesus. That Jesus is the expression of the glory of God. It's the expression of the Father's heart. That's why when Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. He is the heart of God on display. And so think about this. God protects because he knows they don't have the understanding. They don't have the framework to even appreciate and value his son. But in, as Paul says, in the culmination of the times, right? In the dispensation of the times, God sends his son. I hope this is not blasphemous to say this, but basically, Father, God, he uncovers his nakedness. Like, he exposes his heart to humanity. He becomes most vulnerable. He's like, I've been protecting this only for those who can see it. Like David. David had, he was what? After the heart of God. Therefore, he had revelation of Christ. He was able to step into that priesthood of Melchizedek. But the Levites who didn't have revelation, the people who didn't seek the heart of God, they didn't see it. And therefore, there was always a veil and a covering to protect what was precious. But then God, out of his love for the world, says, I'm going to give my son. I'm going to give him. And he sends his son into the world. And we crucify him. I don't know how God honestly does it because I know for me there's, without the touch of the Lord's love on my heart, I can't get my heart to move forward when there's a, when there's, it, it goes past the line of safety or security. But God, he took the risk. He sends his son and we reject him and we put him on the cross. But the father, as the son is lifted up on the cross and his flesh is torn and his blood is poured out, God is saying, here's my heart. Right? He rips open his heart. He says, now you can enter in, but you have to receive the blood of my son. In, order, in other words, in order to enter into the depths of my heart, which is my son, you have to receive my son. And we're very thankful for that. So going back to understanding as we resist cool love, we resist cool love through abounding in love by overflowing in the revelation of his worth, his supreme value above all things, because this is the treasure of God's heart. It's what's most valuable, and when we see what's most valuable to the Father in display, and we behold him, and we inquire of him, we do Psalm 27, 4, we seek the Lord. He's our one thing. 
and we behold him and we inquire him, everything else takes its proper place. Everything else takes its proper place in the light of his glory. When we exalt him as the most excellent thing, he brings us up into our proper place. And we can love our brothers. So honestly, it's, it's simple, even as a house of prayer. What do we do in this season? We grow in worship. We worship. Because as we worship, we behold him. We inquire of him. We set our hearts to one thing focus. And as we do this, we value our value for our brother will increase. The value of our enemies will increase. The thing that you've been arguing with your wife about will suddenly seem childish. The wrestle that you've been confronting, the decision you're like, I don't know if I should do this or I should do this. As he is exalted and his glory is increased, everything else suddenly becomes, oh, that was a wrestle before, but it's not a wrestle now. When he is high and lifted up. And as we do that, this amazing transaction begins to happen. It's, it's actually the cure and the, and the key to unity as a body is worship. Because as we exhaust ourselves at his feet and surrender every opinion, every argument, and we become filled with his interest, his desire, we become, as Ephesians says, Paul says, become one body in one temple. The problem is that we have today is we have many bodies, we have many temples, and we have many spirits because everyone is serving a different Lord. But when we set our hearts to exalt him and worship him and seek Jesus, we're, we have to ask the right questions. Jesus, what do you want? Not arguing, okay, I want this, or this person wants this. It's, wait, let's put that all aside and say, Jesus, what do you want? Let's ask the right questions. What is on your heart? What are you burdened after? And we empty ourselves so he can fill us with his spirit because there's one spirit. One spirit. One spirit. That's where unity comes from. It's not trying to get everyone's different spirits to agree. It's getting emptying us of us and getting filled with his one spirit. We need to fall in love with what he's in love with. But we ask the question, what are the interests of Christ? I think we could all agree, and I'm going to highlight one tonight, and that is Jesus wants a bride. So if he wants a bride and this is a treasure of his heart, then how do we position ourselves in relationship to that? I'm going to strongly submit what John the Baptist says. We have to become friends of the bridegroom. What does it mean to be a friend of the bridegroom? Well, John 3.29 says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. Being a friend of Jesus, the bridegroom, means finding your greatest joy and identity in being the one who stands in the presence of God and hearing his voice. We have to make this clear that the bride is not our bride. It's his bride. And our greatest privilege is is to be ones who stand in his presence and hear his voice. It's how we become one body as well, filled with one spirit, because all of us have our attention and affection on one man, beholding him and hearing him. When Christ's glory becomes our chief aim, then we carry his bride with great care and caution. And some of you guys might be saying, but wait a second, I am the bride. <laughs> or the bride, I'm the bride, right? Well, true, you are the bride. But this has more, has, this expression, friend of the bridegroom, has to do more with the positioning of our hearts in relationship to him and to his bride. True, I am the bride. But when I walk into a room and I'm, I'm ministering alongside Jesus or I'm just around other people, my heart is purified, because remember, all this comes down to being sincere and blameless till the day of Christ, so that we can be the volunteers in the day of his power. But when I position myself as the friend of the bridegroom, I'm not saying, oh, okay, trying to get something from the bride. I'm not praying for someone because it satisfies some religious checkbox. I'm not using someone for my own personal gain. And I can convince myself, oh, it's the Lord. 
But the way that I'm pure is I say, Jesus, this is your bride, and I'm stepping out of the way, and I'm here, and I, Lord, my delight and my contentment is that I hear you, and I stand in your presence. So whether you speak anything through me or not, it doesn't matter, because my identity is not wrapped up in that. My identity is wrapped up in I hear you, and I'm with you forever. We have to, as friends of the bridegroom, we discern the jealousy of the husband as well. And uh, I had this funny picture one time where I was like, imagine if you're the best man and you're standing next to the groom and they do the dun, 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 you know, and the bride starts walking down the aisle and all of a sudden the best man has a change of heart and he suddenly steps out in front of the groom and takes the bride and just goes off. Like, it would be absolutely insanely ridiculous. But the truth is, that's what we, that's what the church has done. Here's the groom. He's I mean, the bride has prepared herself, is preparing herself, and the church is supposed to be friends with the bridegroom, but then they go, oh, I like how it feels when I take care of the bride. I like this, and they become selfish, and it becomes their unjust gain, and they take the bride, and they take it for themselves. We don't want to be like that, because those leaders who have done that, and you don't have to be just in leadership, you will not be a volunteer in the day of your power, of his power. He will not entrust you to be a volunteer in the day of his power. The only way that he's going to, he's only going to trust the friends who have learned to rejoice in him and be fully content in him will be the ones that he gives leadership to in the day of his coming or the outpouring of his spirit. Let's look at friendship a little bit more with Jesus. And I, man, the Lord... I've never studied really the friendship with Jesus before, but the last, I would say, three or four months, the Lord has been blessing my heart with this so much, and it has brought so much healing and rest to my heart, just knowing I'm a friend of Jesus, like Jesus calls me friend. And so I want to I look at friendship. I hope to woo your hearts into this friendship deeper, but what are the main characteristics of being a friend of Jesus? And I'm going to look at humility, I'm going to look at obedience, and we're going to end or look at purity of heart. Uh, I want you to turn to Luke 14, 7 through 11 for, with me. How are you guys doing? Engaged? Feeling it? Okay. Okay. All right. Very quiet tonight, so I'm like not quite sure. You know, last message there's a lot of yeah, man, oh, all right. so I'm like there's always like good feedback, but then it's like really quiet, or like either it's deep or <laughs> no one's tracking. <laughs> um, Luke 14, starting in verse seven, it's the parable of the guests. If you have New American Standard, it calls it that. But so I'm going to read it. It says, and he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them. When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man, and then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. I've, I've actually experienced something similar to that. It's very embarrassing. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, Move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Man, I love that phrase. That phrase was just so sweet. Friend, move up higher. I want to hear that from the Lord. It just, just makes me feel good every time I say it. Friend, move up higher. But I don't believe it's an accident that Jesus uses a wedding feast for this parable right? He's the friend of Jesus is the one who's learned to know his place on earth in light of the bride and her husband. He's learned not to compete with the bride or steal the attention from the bride. He's given the bride her proper place. He's learned, and it's, I mean, it's humility. That's why it ends with those who humble themselves will be exalted. The way that we humble ourselves is not by beating ourselves up. It just means, oh, wow, that's the bride. That's the temple. We have an honor, and we serve, and we wait with the Lord to see what he wants to say. We don't just speak quickly, but we honor the bride. And then 
when we do that on this earth, when he comes in the day of his power and the kingdom, he establishes his kingdom, he then says to us at the feast, friend. Why does he say friend? Because his friend was the one who learned to rejoice in his presence, not take advantage of the bride, but learned to give the bride her place and learned to give the husband his proper place. And he says, friend, move up higher. The other issue is obedience. That was humility. Let's look at obedience. John 15, 14. Jesus says in John 15, 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. This, the Lord, the Lord is not what I don't believe he's saying. I'll say that. I don't believe he is saying this. Is that, oh, if you want to have French with me, you need to go and basically do my commands and then I might give you friendship. I, I don't believe that's the spirit of what Jesus is saying. I believe what he's saying is that when you are friends of me, this is how you'll know. You'll do whatever I command you because I've won your heart. You value what, you've learned to value what I value. And all the commandments of the Lord come down to this. Loving one another. And what is love? It's just value. That's really simply what it is. Is that you, he's given us commandments of how to treat each other like kings and priests. How to love one another. And so when you see his value and you see the value of your brother, you go, oh, wow, your heart is actually moved to keep his commandments. It's not difficult. Your heart actually wants to. Just like when, um, just think of anything you have. Like if you have a, a ratty, dirty shirt, like you don't care, like if it gets another stain on it, right? Because it doesn't have much value to you. But if you've got a nice, like button down shirt, like, and you keep it in one of those nice little, like zippy plastic, like things, you know, and it, it's nice and neat, then, like, you are already taking more care of it because you value it. You don't think, oh, I have to do this. You do it out of your heart because you, you treasure it. So once again, it comes back to that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Well, the bride is Jesus' treasure. So when we love the bride, our hearts will increase in love because he's like, oh, you value what I value? I'm going to give you more love to love her. The root of friendship with Jesus comes down to just learning what he values. But how do we learn what he values? One of the things the Lord told me in prayer, actually, when he was talking to me about friendship, he said, Charles, good friends, listen. <laughs> Real simple, straight to the point. Good friends, listen. The friend of the bridegroom doesn't say he rejoices in the voice of the bridegroom because he's the one who's talking all the time, <laughs> right? He rejoices in the voice of the bridegroom because he's listening. And listening is really beautiful because it actually teaches us humility as well. It's how we position our hearts to receive. And listening also is how we give honor to one another. Your breath is the pneuma of God. It's the, it's the breath of, that he's given you. And so when I... When I incline my ear to you, I'm honoring you. I might not agree with you, but I'm honoring you because I say, you are made in God's image. He's given you breath, and that breath is worthy of being heard. But not only when I'm listening do I incline my natural ear, but what does listening also do? It inclines your spiritual ear as well. And so when you're listening, your heart is actually postured to receive what heaven is saying over that person. At Sadhop, we have a very unique culture here. <laughs> we have lots, uh, everyone here is someone who stands in the presence of God and rejoices at his voice. Everyone, as Corinthians says, has a psalm, a hymn, and a spiritual song to share from their secret place time. So it presents a unique challenge than, what, than anything I've been used to in my Christian experience, because usually there's two or three really strong people in the Lord, and then everyone else just comes for tastings. <laughs> and so for, ta for tastings, you know, like, they're not, they don't actually spend time with Jesus. They don't have anything to give. So you're just kind of, like, quiet. And you're like, well, I guess I'll say something now. I guess I'll say something now. You know, I'll, oh, I guess I'll give more of what the Lord's sharing me. And, but in this culture, everyone is rich in God. And so it presents a different challenge. It's, if we all start sharing everything that we want to share, we're going to have all this chaos and confusion. And if we all share what we believe the Lord's telling us, we're going to have all this division. So this is why it's important to preserve unity that we have to seek the interests of Christ and we have to discipline ourselves as a body to empty ourselves at his presence in worship, exalt him, 
and hear Jesus, what are you saying? Incline our ear to listen, but then also incline our ear to one another. One of the prayers that I pray is, Lord, help me find Christ in each person. Help me bless you in them and help me magnify you in them. We don't do this without listening. Proverbs 22, 11, this is a great verse. It says that he who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious, the king is his friend. I love that. <laughs> when we hear from our neighbor the one who died from them, whose lips are anointed with gracious speech, and we listen, we don't have gracious speech in of ourselves. It flows from him. So when we listen and incline our ear to our brother and our ears incline to heaven, we're positioned to receive his gracious words and to speak his gracious words. And when we receive it and speak it, guess what it does to us? It purifies our hearts. Okay, so let's talk about real quick, and as we wrap up here, we got two main, more main points I want to highlight. Um, only those, I want to highlight this, only those, I said this before, but only those who are pure in heart will be volunteers in the day of his power. A pure heart seeks to hear what the shepherd is saying and then feeds his sheep with his words. A pure heart stands and rejoices at the voice of the bridegroom and prepares the bride for the bridegroom, not himself. During the quarantine time of 2020, the Lord gave me a very specific kind of word and vision that when he comes, that it's going to look like this, that those with big names and big ministries who have shallow intimacy with him are going to be greatly humbled and brought low. And those who are in the secret place with you know, the faceless, the nameless, but have deep lives of the Lord who are friends with Jesus are going to be exalted. And are, you're going to actually see those people ministering to the people who are greatly humbled. Jesus alone will be exalted in that day as the shepherd. And the common denominator for authority is intimacy with him. I want us to turn to Ezekiel 34. And this is, I can't, for time's sake, I can't read through all this. Uh, I'm going to highlight just a few verses, but I'll summarize but in verses uh, 1 through 10, and then verses 17, 18, for the most part, uh, the Lord confronts the bad shepherds. And he says that the bad shepherds are the ones who have scattered the sheep, and they have fed themselves on the sheep instead of fed the sheep. They also trample the pasture. They muddy the waters. They shoulder and thrust at all the weak with their horns. They fail to strengthen the weak and heal the sick and bind up the broken. And he says, woe to them. But then the Lord says in Ezekiel 34, 10, and this has to do with the day of his power. Behold, I am against the shepherds and I will demand my sheep from them and make them cease from feeding the sheep so the shepherds will not feed themselves anymore. But I will deliver my flock from their mouth so that they will not be food for them. The Lord says then in verse 23, I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will feed them himself and will be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. What's interesting is that God says he will set over them one shepherd, right? But if you're familiar with the book of Jeremiah, what does he say? He says, I'm raising up shepherds, plural. In Jeremiah 3.15 and 23.4, he says, I'm raising up shepherds of my own heart. that will feed them with knowledge and understanding. And then uh, that's Jeremiah 3.15, Jeremiah 23.4. He says, I will raise up shepherds after my own heart that will tend them, and they will not be afraid. How are both realities satisfied? How, how are both of these things true? It all has to do with purity of heart. Remember that when Jesus restored Peter after denying him three times, what did he say each time? Tend my sheep. The same Peter goes on to exert the church in 1 Peter chapter 5, shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, <coughs> and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. 
Do we see the sheep as his treasure or a way to puff ourselves up? Do we see the bride as his beloved or our broken cistern? This is not just for pastors and ministry. It's for anyone who has any capacity of stewarding another soul. Parents, bosses, teachers. There's one shepherd whose heart is pure and he flows through the shepherds who have learned to incline their ear to receive his heart and speak his heart. This is why he's raising up shepherds after his own heart that will feed his people with knowledge and understanding. And where do knowledge and understanding come from? Think about it. He raises up shepherds after his own heart to feed them with knowledge and understanding. Why does he say that? Because knowledge and understanding come from his heart. He says in Proverbs 2.6, From his mouth come knowledge and understanding, and out of the heart the mouth speaks. Which means that we have to draw near and listen to what he says. Grow a friendship, grow a history and a testimony of learning to listen to him. Know what's on his heart, what he feels. It's amazing. I was reading in the Gospels recently, I think it's Mark 14, and Jesus uh, heals the uh, demoniac, the demon, demon child, and everyone's like filled with awe and wonder. And you're like, wow, is the next words Jesus is going to say to his disciples they are going to have to do with this? And it, it doesn't. He talks about the cross and his upcoming crucifixion. And you're like, wait a second. You just do this. And everyone's like, whoa, glory of God. The demons left and with power and authority. And they're all impressed with this. But what's on his heart and what he's actually talking to his disciples about has nothing to do with that. He's seeing the suffering that's coming. And so my challenge for all of us is like, are, do we see friendship with Jesus just what we see on the outside? Do we really know what's on his heart? Because many times I would challenge us that what is actually on his heart to talk about is not what we think it is. But we don't grow a history of that until we spend costly time in listening to him. And the purpose of listening is not to it's not to build a ministry one day. It's just to be his friend. But, right, as friends, we like to do what our friends do. So Jesus as his friend, I, know, I don't know about you, but I want to be a volunteer in the day of his power, not because I'm looking for a ministry. I just want to do what he's doing. I want to be involved with what he's doing because I want to experience him. The reason why I'm teaching up here tonight is because I experience him when I teach. That's honestly, I mean, I, I enjoy him. So let's, let's read Psalm 110. Just, and I know I already read this, but uh, the first four verses. Uh, since we read the first four verses, I'm just going to read verse 3 again. It says, Your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power and holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. I think the womb of the dawn can mean many things, but one of the things I would suggest it means is that it's the darkness of night that precedes the brightness of his coming. It's the season where we're most tempted to give in to cold love. But it's the ones who learn to connect to friendship with Jesus, learn what he values, and share his heart are the ones that come out in holy array. They're the ones that become the volunteers in the day of his power. So if purity of heart is, the, is what is required to become a volunteer in the day of his power, and we've learned that from Philippians 1, 9 through 11, that Approving what is excellent is what leads to growing a pure heart. What does Jesus call excellent? I would submit that if you want to know the heart of the shepherd, a good place is to start by studying where he feeds his flock. <laughs> and so we see, even in uh, Ezekiel 34, you guys can turn back there, sorry. I know I go back and forth, but it's kind of the way that these things connect. I'm just going to read verses 13 through 15. It says, I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and bring them to their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the streams and all the inhabited places of the land. I will feed them in a good pasture, and their grazing ground will be on the mountain heights of Israel. There they will lie down on good grazing ground and feed in rich pastures on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord. All right, we know from Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. We see that the result of feeding on what Jesus gives us to feed on leads to what? Rest, restoration of heart, and even more importantly, satisfaction and contentment. Psalm 23 starts, I shall not want. 
This spirit of I shall not want is a stark contrast to the bad shepherds who constantly seek after unjust gain, who feed themselves on the sheep, and who are never satisfied. Why are they never satisfied? Because they have not learned to be friends with Jesus. On the other hand, what is Jesus, what is Jesus, Jesus feeding his sheep that leads them to rest and satisfaction? I would submit the answer lies actually in the book of Songs of Solomon. <laughs> and in two places in Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 16, and chapter 6, verse 3, are one of the most, if, man, if there's any, like, scripture to memorize, just a simple expression, repeat it to the Lord throughout the day. Just hold on to this. Let the Lord encounter your heart. Let him unfold what it means. It says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He who pastures his flock among the lilies. Why does the Holy Spirit pair these two phrases together? I am my beloved's, and he is mine, and he pastures his flock among the lilies. Both places in Songs of Solomon, those are paired together. Why lilies? Anyone have any understanding of lilies? <laughs> Jesus told us to behold them, so it is a commandment. <laughs> Some in what? <laughs> it's really interesting. There's a lot to lilies. Lilies are the longest surviving flower after being cut, supposedly. This is what I found on the internet. Find different sources, go for it, but I did find this on the internet. They represent purity, and a good way to show this, even historically as interpretation, is they were perverted by Greek mythology, who saw lilies as the byproduct, I think it was of Zeus's wife's basically breast milk, and it became a sexualized thing. But the irony of it is that in the original understanding of it was that it meant pure milk, right? Pure milk of the word, but it's, it's pure. It's more like chastisement to the Lord. So it's interesting how Greek mythology perverted it. But they're also edible. I did not know that. You can eat lilies. They're medicinal. They have medicinal properties. And lastly, and most unique... As we've been talking about humility, they're the tallest flower, supposedly, that hangs low. So they're known for being like the humble flower because they're the tallest flower, but its head actually bows down, not faces up. I would submit that the lilies that Jesus feeds his flock on is the reality. I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. That is the lily. It's that confession. It's that purity of vision that actually leads our hearts to rest and contentment. Beloved, I close tonight with a question for you to take into your time with the Lord. Is Jesus enough for you? Is he enough? Is it enough that he is yours and you are his for all of eternity? This is important for preparing our hearts to be volunteers in the day of his power because only shepherds with this purity of vision in their hearts will be entrusted to be volunteers in the day of his power because they know his heart and they see him rightly. It is this purity of heart vision that makes us friends of Jesus. Friends of Jesus can't be tempted by promotion. They can't be tempted by bribery. They can't be tempted by praise of men or fear of men or more influence. They're completely at content and rest in being one who stands in his presence and hears his voice. Whether they be rich or poor, doesn't matter. When your heart is plumb lined according to this truth, you'll never struggle to know what burden is worthy to be carried. You'll never know what needs to be dropped or what doesn't, because you'll always see it's him, and your heart will have made a full commitment. I always say him, because he's enough. I say this from personal experience, not to condemn. But wherever there's a struggle, wherever there's a temptation, wherever there's a like a real struggle to obey the Lord, any sources of anxiety, any sources of oppression, any sources of uh, fear, any source, all of it comes down to a very simple thing. What is competing with this vision? Is this what is most high and lifted up in your heart? Gee, I am his and he is mine forever. Because as soon as you begin to value something, over that, or even close to that, the enemy has something in you to torment you with. What did Jesus say towards the end of hit as he approached the cross? John 14, 30 said, the ruler of the world is coming and he has nothing in me. 
Jesus' heart was like Jasper and starting sense, perfectly pure. His face was set. He was going to do the Father's will. He could do nothing but what the Father told him to do. There was no conflicting selfish pull in Jesus, which is why the enemy couldn't touch him with anything. He could harm his flesh, which they did, but they couldn't touch his identity. And the same goes for us. When our identity is rooted in this, I am his and he is mine forever. So worship team, you can come back up. Um, I share this uh, just as testimony. I don't want anyone to leave this and go, oh man, like, kind of feel heavy. I personally have been really ministered by the Holy Spirit in this capacity. I struggled, I would say, for like two, three years of really tormenting thoughts and wrestles and things and not knowing how to overcome. And I'm just like, oh, it's the enemy, it's the enemy, which it is the enemy. But what I didn't realize is that there was an open door for the enemy to keep pulling upon my heart because what I didn't realize is that I wasn't content in Jesus. I wasn't content in just knowing him. That wasn't enough. I had begun to elevate ministry. I began to elevate my uh, repu- spiritual reputation, the, how men perceived me. Those are big ones. I began to, uh, there was times in my walk with the Lord where opportunity and influence were exalted over Jesus. So anytime there was an opportunity and influence to touch people in a good way, I thought I had to say yes to that. And it always led to bondage and burdens because I didn't seek what his interest was. And therefore, my heart wasn't pure. And so my burden for all of us tonight is get alone with the Lord and and begin to ask him to search your heart of anything that's competing with that vision. Because in the day of his power, if we want to be volunteers and co-shepherds, we have to be ones who value him above everything else. We have to be ones who approve him as most excellent. Anything that we're approving as excellent above him, he will not entrust. That's hard to hear. But it's, yeah, it's true. Um, I want anyone who just needs prayer, you're like, okay, like, um, things are popping up in your conscience, and you're like, I recognize this, I, just come and pray. He's so good. He says that a broken reed he does not break, a smoldering flask he does not quench, and he doesn't cast out anyone who comes to him, and he's an excellent shepherd. He, shep- he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. It's not on you to figure it out. It's not on you to make it happen. It's on you just to come to him. It's on you to stay connected to him through talking to him, through being still in his presence, and through listening. And he wants you to be a volunteer in the day of his power more than you do. And so if you humble yourself and you say, Lord, I can't, I say this many times, God, there is something in me, and I can't get it out. <laughs> I need you to do something. And it doesn't necessarily happen right in a moment. I don't get like, whoa, I just suddenly felt a change of heart. He begins to take me on this path. And it's just a series of scriptures and truths and encounters. And there's nothing like mind-blowing glorious, but they're just little things. And then as they connect, all of a sudden, he like turns the light bulb on. And it's like, it just, my heart opens wide. Because you are his sheep and you hear his voice and he leads you by name. He leads us by name. He wants us for himself. So he's more ready to heal us, more ready to come and rescue us than we even want him to. He just needs a willing heart. He just needs an open heart. And so I encourage, um, who's, who could be on the prayer team tonight? Dere, any, uh, Seth, is it okay if you be on the prayer team tonight? And I'll stand to the side, too. And I just ask that you guys stand on the side so that way you don't get blown away by the speakers. (laughs) But I'm going to end in prayer, and I'm just going to invite you to come up for prayer. If you have children, one of the parents, this would be a good opportunity to go get your kids. I remembered.